Hello and welcome to this repair tutorial and today we're going to look at a Rotel and the model number is RB970BX and this is the Mark II version of this power amplifier. So this unit was released around about 2001 and in terms of general specifications continuous power output is 60 watts per channel into 8 ohm speakers and for this power amplifier at the rear you have a switch where you can switch between stereo mode and bridge mode. So if you select bridge mode then this increases to 180 watts into a single 8 ohm speaker. And then speaker impedance minimum goes down to 4 ohms and then distortion is less than 0.03% over the frequency range of 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And then input sensitivity is 27 kilo ohms uh, with a 1 volt maximum amplitude. And then frequency response 15 hertz all the way up to 100 kilohertz. And then in terms of dimensions, we're looking at a height of 92 with the 440 and a depth of 334 millimeters. And weight comes in at 6.8 kilograms. Now, these units are still highly sought after. In the UK, they probably retail from auction websites around about 160 pounds. And in terms of Rotel separates, you know, it still delivers good performance, even equivalent like to, you know, a more recent or more modern amplifier. And overall build quality is good. Uh, circuit layout is typical for the Rotel. So commonality often between these series of amplifiers. And you even see the same sort of circuit design on the newer products. So what was the issue when this amplifier came in? Well, it came in from a customer who uh, had contacted me via the YouTube channel and was asking really for some technical advice and the customer undertook a degree of repair work but reached a point where he felt that you know he wanted to send the amplifier in to myself and then to complete the necessary work so the issue um, from a full point of view was that there was an issue with the right channel and that's the problem but we'll kind of get into that uh, in a little while because there's a number of other things that we want to sort of look at before we get into the fault finding is and I want to bring this to your attention this amplifier does not have a speaker protection relay output system what it utilizes is two fuses and they are 20 millimeters 5 millimeter OD and the value of them are time delay 6.3 amps now at some point in time these fuses must have been replaced because when they were removed from the cradles the value was fast blow 10 amp and what I'm showing now is a photograph of one of those fuse holders and what you can see is that one end of the fuse holder is not making contact with the fuse now I've mentioned this in other pre tutorials this is a very very common issue it can be that the fuse ends just lose tension over time or it may be that the user has replaced the fuse and as they've inserted it it just splays open the contacts but only one hand end is held in place. So the user then will describe the fault that there's no audio output, uh, believing maybe there's a bigger issue going on, but often there isn't. It's just simply a case of just removing the fuse and taking a pair of long nose pliers and just squeezing in either end of the fuse holder and then snapping back into place the fuse. So this is a very, very common issue, as I say, so one to look out for. So what we did here was just to replace the two fuses with the correct rated, as I said, T or time delay 6.3 amp, and then that issue was sort of resolved. Now, the point to emphasize is that when amplifiers come into the workshop, more commonly it means that the amplifier has failed and no previous repair work has been undertaken. For this amplifier, because repair work had been undertaken, it's really a slightly different approach because you're not working on a fault as it failed it's moved on from there so as with many repairs what you have to do is really to check what only or, or not only what work has already been carried out but any issues which may be underlying which are related to that so what I'm now showing you is a photograph of the circuit board and this is the right channel and um, what you can see is that there is a wire link now what must have happened is that the owner of the amplifier during some repair work uh, of course would have heated up the solder pad now on this amp and this isn't unique to this unit often what you find are these metal links which are interconnecting to connect different component leads relevant to the circuit design or, or to the actual layout of the main board 
and what you can see is once that was heated up unfortunately the link has sort of dropped out so that of course is an issue so in terms of putting back or, or fixing just be aware that sometimes with these amplifiers these wire links are cut very very short when they come through the board and they're not sort of looped over so they're not held in position they're still just pushed through and it's very easy to have something like this occur and this is the point that whenever you undertake any repair work just to spend a little bit of extra time just to verify your work and ensure you know that there's nothing else that's a problem now the other part here is and i sort of show you the solder side of the board there's really a number of options that you have because in the next shot here what you can see is the bottom service plate has been removed now the bottom service plate will allow you access to a degree on the solder side of the board but it's not going to let you full access so what i would advise for this repair is that you need to remove the back panel and that's just a series of fixing screws and then what you'll be able to do is there's two fixing screws towards the toroidal part of the transformer holding the board in position on two mounting pegs just release those and then there's just a series of screws which go through the bottom chassis to the heat sink because the back panel is removed you'll be able to just lift up the board and that's what i'm showing here that is the circuit board lifted up just make sure that you put something underneath maybe a cloth just to prevent it from damaging the bezel and you're free then to work on it now there were a number of damaged solder pads from the previous repair work and some of those solder pads are ripped away from the board so it was a case then of just using copper foil a reasonable thickness and then just putting that into position then to repair each one of the solder pads there's probably about three of them that were badly damaged and then also to verify that the output transistors were good and there wasn't any issue there but what was found and i'm now showing you in the in the schematic what you can see here is the output stage of the amplifier and the transistor which had an issue was q623 and that is a 2sd 600k and what i found was that uh, it was open circuit i'm also highlighting as well the speaker protection fuses as, as you see and as i said earlier you know just one of them had the issue and it was actually linked to the right channel and then with regard to the rear of the amplifier as i said earlier what you have is a selection switch to flick between stereo and bridge mode now what i'm showing you is the switch removed from the circuit board and i've just disassembled it what you have is two sets of slide contacts one is to make the electronic switching over to route for the bridge mode and then the other part of the switch is just for the led indication on the front so it clearly shows if it's running in stereo mode or bridge bridge mode the led will illuminate um, what I've done is I've cleaned the contacts and the switch with a fiberglass pencil. There was quite a lot of oxidisation on there. And then what I do is I just apply some deoxid uh, grease just because of the moving parts. But also to add this longevity, which I always mention, which will help to prevent any further oxidisation. You may say, well, what's the point of doing that? Well, as with all switches in older amplifiers, you will always get oxidisation and it can lead maybe if it's an input switch to low level distortion or even intermittent loss of audio so you know just take the time take it out strip it apart and then clean it up and then the other thing that I'll, i want to sort of mention as well and if we go back to the schematic what i'm now showing you is the layout of the amplifier and this is taken from the service manual now although this is showing mark ii it appears if you do a google search that you can't find the mark ii service manual but the Mark 1 appears to be almost identical. So maybe they made some technical changes. Uh, I didn't go in detail to find out what they were. But all the component reference numbers seem to be correct. So once the transistor was replaced, the solder pads repaired, and then also the wire link reinstalled. And what I did, of course, is then to clean up the board with a flux remover. Even on the left channel, there seemed to be quite a lot of flux around some of the output transistors. So cleaned all of that board up. And then what I also do, as is common, is you just scan the board over to make sure that there's no additional dry joints, which there weren't. And then once that is done, what I do is I'll refit the board. And then what I also do as well is I just make sure that, that common ground screw, which goes through the top of the circuit board, and then goes it's like a metal fixing post and then onto the bottom plate is in position 
And then what I'm highlighting, of course, the test points. Now, this is where you would connect your multimeter if you needed to set up the bias, which, of course, we do because repair work had been carried out on the right channel. But at the same time, we also work then to set the left channel. Now, the service manual for the Mark 1, they must have copied and pasted it from something else. Because what it refers to, it talks about setting the volume control to minimum. Well, this is a power amplifier, so there is no volume control. So here we have no speakers connected. And then what I do is I just use some grounding caps just to ground the input to the amplifier. Or you can leave them open if you wish. I just have them make sure that the switch is in the stereo mode. And then what I do is I connect a digital multimeter to the test points. Now, this is very, very important. And again, I've mentioned this in other tutorials. What I would avoid doing is taking your multimeter probe and then just trying to push it against one of the test point pins. And then at the same time, trying to read your meter and then going in there with a preset adjustment tool, you're going to slip at some point, which will result in your shorting out maybe, you know, one of the output transistors. So always use these hook clips and connect them then to the test points. Then you're free to look at the multimeter and then singularly make the adjustment. Also as well, remember that you need to clean presets. So this is VR601 and 602. So this is with the amplifier depowered. And what I would advise is to spray into there a good quality switch cleaner or deoxid and then rotate the preset potentiometers backwards and forwards multiple times so it cleans the carbon tracks. That will allow adjustment because these are single term presets and it will be much easier to do that if they're clean. That avoids this jittery effect that you can get or where you get it to a point then all of a sudden it will then jump. But what I always do, and I've said this previously, I always power up the amplifier after repair and during an initial test phase with the dim bulb tester and I'll put the link in the description for the video. Once I'm confident that there is no other issue and there's no excess current, what I'll do is I'll just adjust it just to a nominal point. Now this amplifier requires 8 millivolts for each one of the bias settings. So I'll bring it up to about 6 millivolts and then I'll put the amplifier onto full power, disconnecting the dim bulb tester. I'll be monitoring with the multimeter and as long as it's not going excessively high, I'll leave it running for about 15 to 20 minutes. That will mean that the overall stabilization of both channels takes place. And then the next thing that I'm showing you is the right channel input stroke pre-driver stage. And again, a very, very common design. So you can see that I'm highlighting the bias trimmer. All you're doing is you just make the adjustment until your meter reads 8 millivolts. And that's what I'm showing now in the video. So you can see the multimeter in the background. The hook clips are now connected and then just slight adjustment and this is repeated because as you make the adjustment just wait a few minutes till you get stabilization and then repeat now remember you may get it bang on eight millivolts but there will be a small amount of fluctuation not high but a small amount but even if you don't get it bang on eight millivolts you know if it's just a nominal around there then you know that is fine there's no sort of concerns there and then if we look back now at this input schematic, I just want to sort of mention a couple of other things as well. Commonly with, with these types of amplifiers, once you set up the bias, as we have, the next thing to do is to check the DC offset. Now, remember, this amplifier doesn't have a safety circuit or protection circuit. What you do to check the DC offset is just to put your multimeter onto millivolts and connect your probe leads across the speaker terminals at the back or the speaker binding post and just verify what that millivolt reading is. If that millivolt reading is high, so in this case when we checked it, it was about 8 millivolts, which is perfectly fine. But if it was maybe, you know, two, 300 millivolts or maybe more, then that tells you that there is an issue, of course, with the amplifier. Now, what can be misleading is sometimes, maybe if you're not familiar with repairing amplifiers, you believe that it has something to do with the output stage, but it hasn't. What has happened here is, is that over time, components have then started to drift. And the components that you need to look at, and the importance of having this schematic or this part of the schematic shown, is you can see that the input signal arrives, and then we have what we call long tail pairs. So these are the two transistors just towards the upper part and then the lower part. And what you can see there is that the emitters of the transistors are common together. Now, 
At factory, the HFE or game would be nominally matched, so very little difference between them. If you see this DC offset, which can be both positive and negative, the first area that you need to focus on are these input transistors here. Now you may want to remove them and sit there checking them on your meter or maybe on a transistor tester but you know you're kind of spending time that you don't need to do. The best thing to do is just to replace those transistors maybe use your transistor tester just to match up the gain of them so they're pretty much equal. Once you've replaced them you'll find that the amplifier DC offset will correct and it will be back to you know a very very low value so in terms of repair for this amplifier I would not say you know it's a complicated repair but with all the work that's been carried out on it in terms of adjustment for the bias and then you know this low level DC offset you know the amplifier should deliver you know many hours high quality sound for years to come so as i say you know if you are looking to repair one of these amplifiers then of course you can use this tutorial as a guidance but alternatively if you need any help or support by all means email audio amplifier servicing at aol.com and i'll be happy to come back to you and provide any guidance or support that you may require so until the next time, thanks very much for stopping by, cheers and bye bye.